welcome back to ATA's Econ Chats, brought to you by the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. I am your host, John Humphreys, from the Australian Taxpayers Alliance, and I am joined, uh, I was going to say as always, but I should say as often, as usual, uh, by Gene Tunney. Gene, how are you doing? Good, thanks, John. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Another beautiful day in paradise. I think I used yeah, that one last week. Absolutely. One. Um, I mean, we've so got a the, youth crime issue, but other, other than that, it's uh, it's beautiful. Yes, yes. Well, one of the small upsides of no longer being a youth, right? So I get to escape the whole thing because now that I'm an old man. Um, quickly, so housekeeping. Uh, this is uh, a live, casual and interactive chat. We do this every Tuesday, 7 p.m. Queensland time, 8 p.m. New South Wales, Victoria time, and the other states can work that out. Casual and interactive by casual. I mean, this is live, unscripted. Uh, we, uh, we, we don't often know how our sentences are going to end when we start them, and we're happy to get distracted, and uh, we're not exactly sure what we're going to say. We frame this as a bit of a debate. I think we're going to disagree, but I'm not entirely sure what Gene's going to say yet, uh, so we'll see. It, it, it might disappoint you all, and we'll end up with too much agreement, but I, I suspect not. I, I suspect there'll be something to disagree over on fiscal policy. So that's by, by casual, unscripted, interactive, as in uh, this is being uh, simulcast in a bunch of places. You can chat in those places. We are keeping our eye on the chat. So we are happy to interact with you. If you ask some good questions, we're happy to go down any rabbit hole or distraction that you give us. Well, not anyone, but any good one. So feel free to put in your comments, your criticisms, your questions as we go. Uh, if they're good or funny, uh, or even if they're not, uh, we, we may put them up and interact with them. So feel free to chat with each other, chat with us, and let's have a bit of fun over the course of the next hour. Uh, one last thing, then this is simulcast onto YouTube and Facebook on three different channels, the Australian Taxpayers Alliance channel, Good Source channel, and my personal one, John Humphreys. So please go along to those. If you're watching it now, you're watching it on one of those uh, three channels or in two formats. Uh, please give it a like, please follow those places and please go to the other ones and, and like them and follow them as well. We are trying to uh, boost the number of people that follow those various accounts. So it'd be great if you could jump onto the other ones and give them a like, give them a follow, give them a share as well. So diving straight in. First thing, uh, we're, we're no longer going to be uh, covering events of the week. You can just see the links below in the write up. Uh, what we are still going to do is a quick wrap up of the uh, latest pieces of information, the uh, kind of in case you missed it uh, for the last week. A few little tidbits of information. I'll, I'll just shout some out and then, Gene, you can give me a running take and we see if we can start our argument early. Look, the, the big <laughs> piece of economic news from the last week is the unemployment data. The, the employment data writ large dropped uh, in the last week. And the noticeable thing is that the unemployment rate has gone from 3.5 to 3.7% which is still very low, but it is now uh, tricking up, uh, ticking up, and it's uh, higher than a few people expected. At the same time, same time the participation rate dropped down only, only by 0.1, so it's down to 66.5. So a slight drop in participation, slight increase in unemployment, decrease in employment. It's the, the indicators of what I've been saying for a while on this show that I do think we are trending towards something that's gonna look like a, a recession, by which I mean a per capita recession. So I, I'm interested in the per capita GDP stats, not the total GDP stats, or even the, the GNP stats, or NN, the net national income. The, so the, the correct measures of the quality of our life. That, that's what I'm interested in, not arbitrary statistics that don't impact on us and don't mean anything to us. Uh, and I think we are tiptoeing or perhaps have already started in a recession. So that's, you know, one, one more tick uh, towards evidence backing me up on that one. Uh, so, what, what about that, Gene? What do you think? A any comments on the unemployment rate? Well, because it was for January, it's difficult to read too much into it. What some of the bank economists are saying is that there were an abnormally large number of people waiting to start jobs in February, uh, that, and that they uh, they weren't uh, picked up as uh, as employed. Therefore, so there's a there's an argument that that could be uh, distorting those figures to an extent. Um, look, yeah, possibly the economy is starting to slow down. We get we've got mixed data from different companies. JB I think's had a bit of a slowdown. JB Hi-Fi, but 
Uh, West Farmers, I think, had a report the other day, seems to be holding up. I think it might have been West Farmers. So we've got some mixed data that are, uh, that are out there. I think it's too early to call uh, how the economy, whether we're ha going to have a recession or not. I don't think we're in one at the moment, potentially later this year or next year, but yeah, just too hard to tell at the moment. Well, I, I agree the smart call is to not make the prediction. Indeed, the smart call generally is to not make predictions. So I've gone yeah. out and learned, I could well be wrong, but it's far more fun to put your neck on the line and uh, to allow people to then judge you in real time each week as the data comes in. So I've, I've done that. I've made that mistake. So now I have to back it up. Uh, the other pieces of news for the last week, uh, the, well, it's a small thing. The RBA has announced their thinking for their last rate rise. And it was just interesting to note that they actually did consider a 50 basis point rate increase. They considered increasing rates by even more. Now they didn't, but that kind of shows the mentality and, and shows that uh, we already knew this, there's going to be another rate increase, but now we there's no doubt of that now. So that's definitely uh, it coming down the pipe, another rate increase that we're already thinking of doing an extra 25 basis points. And the one last little bit of information from the last week, if you haven't seen it, is it looks like, this is mixing two of our previous episodes, it looks like Jim Chalmers, the, uh, as Gene told us about a couple of weeks ago, the author of the idea of new capitalism, the, the dodgy amalgam of big government and big business, uh, Jim Chalmers has started to put that into, into play uh, by going after superannuation. So they, the rant I gave a couple of weeks ago about my complaints about compulsory superannuation. So Jim Chalmers has now come out and said that he, he does want to change the super industry. He wants to stop people being able to take super out early. He wants to decrease the tax advantages of super and he wants to somehow, details pending, incentivize super funds to put more money into his pet projects. So it's uh, it, that's that's not the topic for the rant this week, but it's a, a worthwhile thing to note that that was a, a new piece of news in economic policy for the last week. You had any thoughts on that one, Gene? Oh, well, I mean, it's exactly as we talked about and as uh, people in the chat uh, predicted it's the implementation of uh, values based capitalism as uh, as he calls it so yeah i mean it yeah it's uh it is a bit of a, a concern um but yeah let's see practically what it means and i mean super funds do have that that uh, duty to invest on in the interests of their their members but then as as has been pointed out uh, there's concerns about the composition of the boards of super funds isn't there so yeah, let's see how it all goes. I mean, um, I can I can see where they're coming from in terms of uh, the 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 policy that they they want to make it clear that it is for retirement. Yeah, that's that's fine. Uh, but yeah, if if we're going to be actively encouraging them to invest for social purposes rather than the interests of their members, that is a big concern. So yeah. Agree well, of course, they're going to end up wrapping it up in the language of good social investment is is good economic investment, which is the the standard line. I, I don't believe it, but I I suspect they will wrap it up in language like that. Well, Judith Sloan had a good piece on this in the Australian today, I think, didn't she? And, and Judith was pointing out that if you look at these uh, these you know investments that are ethical or uh, are more ethical than others, uh, depending on your what your value judgments uh they actually perform worse than the the, the uh the investments that are, are are less ethical so uh depending on how you assess that so uh yeah it's not necessarily a, a good thing i thought judith's column was really good uh i think it was judith oh, yeah definitely worth reading just reflecting As they on are, yeah, in the australian i think today yeah yeah that point you made about monetary policy and the their thinking that they were they were thinking of a 50 basis point increase. I think we should be asking, well, if they know that interest rates are going to have to get up further and there's a debate about whether it's going to get to 3.85 as a couple of the banks are forecasting, 4.1, this is the cash rate, as some other banks are forecasting, or even 4.85 as Michael Knox is forecasting, I mean, who knows? If, it's, if we know it's got to go up further, they're on this tightening cycle, what's the point of delaying it? Shouldn't we just get there as soon as possible? And this is a point that Larry Summers made uh, with reference to what the Federal Reserve's doing in the States. If you know that it's got to get up to that rate, then 
why aren't just just go there straight away and that's going to be really good for your credibility and getting inflation under control get the pain over with uh, I, I can't I, I guess the the RBA is thinking it's a bit easier if we, we ease people into it maybe it'll be less painful but I really don't know yeah. I can see I can see Larry Summers's uh, point of view there I, I entirely agree with you although I think the time to do that was uh, the winter last year was was six or seven or eight months ago when they started. I think they should have hit it with a, I argued at the time, a full percent. And yep. then they should have kept going with, with 0.5s, moved to that higher rate much quicker. Um, and, and I think that would have uh, slowed down the excess money floating around the economy and, and got inflation under control in the in the direct ways. But also the signal it would have sent was that uh, the RBA is is much more serious, aggressively serious. And of course, those signals can be a part of the policy themselves as people uh, use those signals to make their assessment about their expected inflation and therefore their behaviours. So I, I very much agree uh, early on. I think the, the argument they use is by doing a bunch of 25 basis point changes, so 0.25 of a percent is what that means. They, they keep it in the news cycle. So they're firstly, I think they're a, a bit gun shy. They're scared to spook people. They, they want to let yeah. people adjust. And they also want to keep it in the news cycle. So they're constantly dripping it out, squeezing, squeezing. Uh, look, I, I, understand, I understand all of the words in those sentences. I think it's a mistake. I think they should have gone. I think they, should have, they made a mistake in keeping the rates too low for too long. And when they started tightening, they made a risk mistake by being too meek and too passive and not increasing them quick enough. I'm not sure if now's the time, though, because I, I think the time to have done that is immediately. Now, as we start to sneak up on the top rate, as you start to sneak up on the correct amount, you need smaller increments. So it's, I, I very much agree with your point, but I think they missed the opportunity. So if it's, right. if they're looking to go at around 4%, then this is about the time you start jumping to the smaller increments. So I, I don't begrudge them now. I don't know if they're making a mistake now. I think they made some significant mistakes over the last couple of years though. And we are living with the consequences of those mistakes now. Yeah. Uh, although, yeah. So that, that, that's my take on that one. Look, um, the, the one comment came in here uh, from Melissa. Interesting. The uh, super fund sponsoring the AFL. How's that good for their members? Look, at this is, uh, to be fair, most businesses engage uh, in, in some amount of marketing. Uh, although realistically, in the super funds, it's not voluntary. So, <laughs> I mean, that, that is, look, I understand why they're still marketing to try and get the customers off the other super funds, but it does put it in a slightly different light, right? I mean, they've got this marketing budget, uh, and normally part of marketing budget is to convince people to, to buy your product. It's compulsory to buy your product in Australia. <laughs> so, yes, I, I take your point, Melissa. It's a, a bit cheeky to see that sort of stuff. Look, Gene, at this point, I think I'm going to uh, give you the big screen. Uh, and well, you can... well, I just wanted to point out another piece of data, John. Did you see the yeah. overseas arrivals statistics that came out uh, last week as well with a big, uh, big surge in in January in arrivals, so 1.6, uh, what is it, 1.6 million up from uh, 1.26 in December. So yeah, overseas uh, arrivals are, are really coming back strong. So we're gonna have uh, high rates of immigration again, uh, and uh, you know potentially a debate over the impact of uh, immigration and what the appropriate rate of immigration is. Yeah, I, I did see that. They they haven't disentangled what the people are coming in and out of the country for. So I, yeah. I was waiting. The migration data will come out soon enough, and then we should definitely do a a, a longer chat about that. But, yeah, I, I saw it's it's still not at the level as it was pre-pandemic, pre-shutdown. Uh, but, yes, it's bounced back significantly now. So they, And it, actually the bigger bounce back came from people leaving the country. So Australians are finally taking those holidays that they've been waiting for for the last couple of years. Uh, oh yeah, and, yeah. A few of my friends went over to Japan to ski, and yeah, people are going all over the world and visiting relatives overseas. They haven't visited for years because they were they weren't allowed to, right? So yeah. What an yeah. interesting part of that uh, migration debate when we have it, which you know, we we haven't penciled that in for today, but we should have that discussion. Is uh, it's very likely that the the low rate of migration over the last couple of years was one of the causative factors of us having such low uh, unemployment rate. Yeah. In, in recent times. So that's going to be an interesting one to watch because I, I, I have another theory on why we've got unexpectedly low unemployment at the moment, which I, I haven't seen too many other people put this out and I, I don't yet know how to disentangle the different forces. But we've seen inflation over the last uh, 18 months. In the, in the recent history, we've seen a bunch of inflation. Wages haven't kept price with inflation. 
Uh, I think if you're looking at it from a business perspective, capital costs and other inputs into business have inflated. Wage costs haven't as much. For a business perspective, the relative costs of, of capital and inputs and land and labor, if you look at the relative costs, labor has become relatively cheaper. And I would argue that that's a, a big causative element in the low unemployment rate. You, it's standard, it's a standard economics, supply and demand. We understand applied to the labor market. If the wage goes down, you would expect the demand for labor to go up. And we've seen some real wage decreases over the last 12 months. I mean, wages in real terms have gone down. Wages have gone up, but they've only gone up a little and prices have gone up a lot. And that's what I mean by mm. wage, real wage decrease, how much you can buy with your wage has gone down, which is obviously not something we enjoy to live through. But one of the, I think, unexpected consequences of that has been that uh, they, from a business perspective, it's become less economic to invest in capital and more economic to invest in labor. And we've seen that, right? We've seen a decrease in investment. And uh, until the latest data came out, we'd seen an increase in demand for labor. At the same time that we stopped letting migrants into the country. So we had fewer workers available. So that, that's my other theory on that. Uh, I think they're both causes. I don't know how to disentangle which one's the bigger cause, although we may be able to find out now as we open up the country. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's certainly, um, I mean, I never thought I'd see an Australian unemployment rate three and a half percent. So, I mean, we would have thought low fours was an amazing achievement, right? And yet we got down to that. It was uh, extraordinary. And I think it, it has got got to do with what happened with uh, migration during the pandemic. But maybe we come back to that, John, and uh, we can look at uh, fiscal policy. Yeah, I will give you the, the conch then and uh, take it away on fiscal policy. Okay, thanks, John. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. I thought this would be a good topic because when Phil Lowe, the RBA governor, appeared before the House of Representatives Committee, uh, actually the Senate Estimates, the Senate Committee on Economics last Wednesday, they asked him a question about what's the contribution of the federal government to this or the budget? Is, is the budget contributing to inflation? And, and Phil Lowe said he thought that fiscal policy was broadly neutral which uh, I think was uh, a, a fairly good way for him to evade uh, any political controversy. I think he got out of that. He did, he did reasonably well in, uh, in terms of avoiding uh, the controversy. But I'm not sure he's correct that fiscal policy is broadly neutral. So if we, we're talking about the government budget, in my reading of the, the data and the, the analysis that's come out of places such as Treasury and the, the IMF, my reading of it is that the federal government could be doing a lot more to reduce the impact of the budget on the economy. I think there's a concern that because of the state of the budget, like John, you showed last week that it looks like it's coming back close to balance, which is great, but that's not really because of anything the federal government's doing. I mean, partly... There's some contribution, but it's mostly because of higher commodity prices, the strength of the economy. So given the state of the economy, where we are in the economic cycle, the federal government should be running a budget surplus of possibly a couple of percent of GDP. Now, John, if you show that first chart, it's a chart from the federal budget, which is what it's showing is what's called the structural budget balance. And I'll, I'm going to put a link in the, uh, in the notes to this later, John. But that, where I'm pointing, actually, you may not be able to see where I'm pointing, but the, just before 2023-24, the, the bars next to that dotted line, that's for the 2022-23 financial year. So that's the... Uh, the next one over. That's the one we're in. And what's that? what that is showing, that blue bar there is showing that cyclical factors, so the strength of the economy, that's basically improving the budget balance by nearly 2% of GDP. So we're talking, I mean, we've got, Australia's got a $2 trillion economy, so a $2,000 billion economy. And uh, so a 2% of that is... Uh, around uh it's you know it's nearly 40 billion dollars so 
that's what the the economy is how, how it's helped improve the budget that much but the government is has still been running i mean when this chart was prepared it was still projected to run a budget deficit of nearly two percent of gdp now that's improved that's come back a lot because of that blue bar is now going to be even higher because of higher commodity prices and stronger economy than that estimated last year. This is a chart from the budget last year. The problem we've got in Australia is that the federal government is running a structural budget deficit, and that's the red line there, the red bar. So that's pushing the budget into the negative territory. And there's also a t the green bar there, which is the temporary fiscal measures. So we've still got some hangover of spending that they agreed to during the pandemic. And so what we've effectively got is a government budget that is still in deficit. It's, it's not as badly as in deficit as it was, as we thought it was last year, but it is still in deficit and it should be in surplus of around 2% of GDP, according to these estimates here for in the, and this is published by the, the treasury. This is in the federal budget in the, the fiscal policy statement. When I look at that, I'm thinking if they, there is a, the possibility to uh, cut back on spending, I mean, I'll, I know this is the Australian Taxpayers Alliance, so we're not going to recommend any increase in, in taxation, but we should be, the government could be doing a lot more to, to get inflation under control. I mean, my view is that they, they really need to be tackling that structural budget deficit. Now, I, I should note that th this is not all entirely the current government's fault. I think this has been building up for years, this, uh, this structural budget balance problem, uh, just due to the fact we've got an NDIS, we've got all of these spending commitments, we've got, uh, tax, we've got a tax system that, well, I mean, no one likes paying taxes and uh, we're just not willing to, to to increase taxes to the level of, of spending. I'm not recommending we do that. Uh, but if we're not going to do that, then we certainly need to cut spending and we're just unwilling to do that. So I think there is scope for the federal government to cut back spending, reduce that structural deficit and have less of an impact on the economy, cut back on the contribution to an overheating economy that is contributing to inflation. Now, how much of the I, you know, seven point eight percent inflation rate. This is contributing, maybe I don't know a percent to two percent. I don't know. It's so it's so hard to estimate. But I think it is. I think there's certainly scope for the government to do more. And I disagree with Phil Lowe that the contribution of the federal government or fiscal policy is broadly neutral. I'm I'm not sure that's the right way to characterise it. Do you have any thoughts on that, John, at the moment? Apologies, I muted myself while you were chatting to make sure people didn't hear papers uh, yeah. rough as we went. Look, yes, I, I was going to uh, wait to the end, but we can uh, jump this back and forth. Uh, look, I, I might bring us back on the screens here. Look, I, I agree and disagree. So we, okay. we, we do get to have some debate. Firstly, uh, I, I agree that the budget should be balanced now, right? So it's uh, the, it was estimated originally to be $80 billion deficit. That is outrageous. It should be nothing like that. Then they got it back to 40 or, or 37 to be more precise. Uh, and that's a step in the right direction. Still too high. I think you're right. There's, there's still no need for a, a deficit that big. I think it is now back on track to be in the 20s. Uh, and yeah. that's a nice step forward. Uh, but again, I, I still agree with you. I, I, I think the budget should be balanced at this point in time. I don't think we need a, a big surplus either. I do think we've got enough headwinds coming up that uh, basically we should just have a, a neutral budget balance. I think that's normally what it should be. Uh, aim, aim for a neutral budget balance. So I, I agree with that part of your assessment. I guess the part where I, I disagree, and this could get quite wonkish for the people following along at home, is uh, I don't think that the fiscal policy is, is very relevant to the inflation. Uh, I think that not because I think they have done a good job. I think it primarily because I just think fiscal policy is mostly ineffective. I am not a Keynesian. I am not a believer that uh, fiscal policy works to pump prime an economy in a meaningful or long-term way. So firstly, no one thinks it's a long-term way except journalists. But even mm. in the short term, I agree it has some impact. 
right? I, I don't begrudge that. It has some impact. But I think the amount of impact is overestimated by most people. Uh, and in terms of what would be causing the inflation we've seen over the last 12 to 18 months, I think that is overwhelmingly the acts of the RBA. Uh, and maybe there's a little bit of sprinkle on top from the fiscal policy. And I, and I worry that because fiscal policy, you can blame a politician. So there's much more incentive for talking heads and journalists and the opposition party to really talk up the fiscal policy because they get to blame a politician. Uh, and it's less obvious that you can make political mileage out of blaming a bureaucrat. Uh, so I, but I do think it is overwhelmingly the mistake of the bureaucrats. It's overwhelmingly a mistake of the RBA, which I'm, I'm caught in a weird situation. Everyone wants to blame the politicians for this. I say, no, it was the RBA. And then generally at the moment, lots of people want to blame the RBA for what they're doing now. I think what they're doing now might be close to correct. I just think they made massive mistakes over the last couple of years and we're paying the price for that now. Now, the reason I say fiscal policy doesn't, uh, doesn't lead to inflation because I'm saying fiscal policy mostly doesn't work. Why am I saying that? Well, there's four ways that fiscal policy uh, doesn't work as advertised, right? So the Keynesians say uh, the government spends the money, it puts the money into the economy, there's more money in the economy and that's uh, more money chasing goods makes a, a short-term boost, and then that short-term boost should go away as the prices adjust. So that's the standard Keynesian theory. And there's four reasons why it's not particularly true. Uh, my instinct is to start with the least strong arguments first and work my way up, but then I worry that if I do that, people might take the wrong lesson from this. So I'm going to start by just mentioning the biggest reason fiscal policy doesn't work. Australia has an open economy. There is free capital flows in and out of the country. Uh, and what that means is we are exposed to uh, crowding out, international crowding out. Now, if anyone's done first year econ, you'd know about the crowding out idea. It's often taught as domestic crowding out. But the idea is that the government borrows money but because the government's using the money, they take it out of the financial sector, financial markets. The money isn't there to lend to businesses. So the idea is that the government runs a deficit because they run a deficit uh, the interest rates go up, there's less investment. So yes, there's more government spending, that's great. G, G goes up, or if they give the money to consumers, consumption goes up, but interest rates go up and that actually drives down investment. So that is a mechanism. That's one of the four that I mentioned before, but actually for open economies like ours, that's not a very big issue, right? Domestic crowding out exists, but it's not a big issue, right? But the, the bigger issue is we're an open economy. So what normally happens there when the, the government wants to uh, borrow money, run, run a deficit, which is borrowing money, uh, they have access to international markets. So instead of pushing up interest rates, what it would normally do is they'll just go and borrow the money from international markets, which, you know, most government bonds are sold internationally. And to the degree that they're sold domestically, that's a domestic buyer that then needs to borrow that money internationally as well to get the total amount of capital stock in the economy the same. So this is borrowing from overseas. Right? Fundamentally, budget deficits are funded by borrowing more money our country borrows more money from overseas. Uh, and what does that do? It drives up the exchange rate higher than what it otherwise would be, which drives down net exports, drives down exports, drives up imports. Uh, and you see this uh, you see this happening all the time when the interest rates uh, look like they're going up, the dollar goes up uh, in, in recognition of that. Uh, and you saw, for instance, with the GFC, when they uh, suddenly, when, before they announced big stimulus, our dollar was going down and our net exports were going up. And that was our natural balance. That was the, the natural stimulus happening at the time. And then the Rudd government introduced massive stimulus. Our dollar spiked and our net exports went down. So we, we, we already had China coming to the rescue, as the saying goes, we're back with the GFC. And you see this direct crowding out. And the theoretical underpinnings of domestic crowding out is contested. Right? You can have really good arguments on both sides. And, and the Keynesians have a good case that domestic crowding out doesn't always happen. But the international crowding out, the theoretical underpinnings for that are extremely strong, right? If, if money is flowing in uh, to, to our economy through capital flows, it has to flow out some other way. And it flows out some other way, either by less investment, domestic crowding out equivalent, or it flows out some other way uh, through decreased net exports, which fundamentally undermines the effectiveness of fiscal policy. Now, that's not complete. I'm not pretending that international crowding out is complete. Uh, but it is significant and significantly more than what most people think it is. So you have that, you combine that with some domestic crowding out, you then combine that with some amount of Ricardian equivalence. And I grant you that's probably a bad term because it, it, it implies a, a process that we don't understand. We don't understand the process, but we do seem to know that when the government runs a big deficit, people save more. 
Uh, and then you, you add with that that if the fiscal policy is successful, by definition, it's only successful by putting more money into the economy. And if the Reserve Bank is doing their job, they should then take that amount of money out of the economy. Mm -hmm. So it, it is four reasons why fiscal policy shouldn't be effective. Uh, and it's not complete. It's a little bit effective. But I think that international crowding out point is a real killer. Right? It's a real killer. It means for open economies with free capital flows, fiscal policy just does not work as well uh, as most of the Keynesians would have us believe, which means it doesn't give us the benefit, but it also means it's not responsible for the inflation, right? Because it basically just, if it doesn't work very much, it didn't give us much net benefit, but it's also not responsible for the costs. Now, there's one tweak on this, and that is people note that the Reserve Bank was buying up uh, government bonds, right? So the government was had a big deficit, and the Reserve Bank was printing money to buy those bonds. And people say, aha, see, by going into deficit, the government is contributing to more money. But that's a decision of the RBA, right? The government doesn't force the RBA to pursue quantitative easing, which is what that is, right? When they print money to buy government bonds. The government doesn't force the RBA to do that. The RBA chose to pursue quantitative easing. They shouldn't have. That's the RBA's mistake. So I, I don't mean to let politicians off the hook. I think most of them do a pretty shitty job in general, uh, and I think they're responsible for a lot of mistakes. But in this instance, I really do believe, uh, as I've said earlier, and I'll say again, uh, the first step you have to take to solving a problem is to correctly identify it. If you misidentify the problem, your solutions are going to uh, not necessarily work out as you'd hoped. And I think the correct, correct way to identify this problem was the RBA kept interest rates too low for too long, and when they started to move, they moved too slowly and too meekly. And I think that explains more than 90% of the story. So that, that's where I disagree. I disagree on that, uh, the, the degree to which it causes inflation. But to just, you know, a, a compliment sandwich, go back to the original bit. I do agree, by the way, that they shouldn't be running a deficit now. There's no mm. reason to be running a deficit. And what this does is it builds up debt. And this is debt that just has to be, we pay interest on it. Someone has to pay it off in the future. It's debt we pass our children. Uh, and this debt isn't huge at the moment. But if someday in the future we need to, to run deficits for some ex exogenous reason, this weakens our ability to be able to do that. Right? So we don't want debt that we don't need to have. So I agree with you. We should, uh, we should be running a balanced budget. Mm, yeah, particularly this stage of the cycle. I guess what I was uh, annoyed by or, or didn't agree with was the idea that fiscal policy was broadly neutral. It, I mean, I guess if Phil Lowe is, I mean, maybe he's agreeing with you, John, that he, in his view that he thinks it isn't really making much of an impact. I mean, my my reading of the the data and the estimates from Treasury is that, yeah, they're, they're running a deficit that's about 2%. Uh, well, the budget balance should be 2% better than it is. That is adding to demand. That's meaning businesses are... Are, uh, you know they've got more work uh, there's there's more you know more activity in the economy than there there would otherwise uh, yeah I mean my sense is that it would make it would make a contribution to reducing inflation if they they turn the budget around how much yeah maybe it is only a, a one a percent I mean you said maybe it's ten percent of the problem oh, I'd probably think I'd, I'd say it's a bit higher than that but I wouldn't say it's half of the problem so I guess we're arguing about just how much of a, an impact it has, and that's an empirical question, ultimately. It and is an empirical we'll, question, but it's yeah. a hard one to disentangle. Yeah. Uh, so, look, I, yeah, do you yeah. have a response to that? Um, the, the technical name for the argument I made there, international crowding out, is the Mundell-Fleming critique uh, of fiscal policy. Do you, well, you don't find it persuasive that uh, budget deficits lead to an influx of international capital flows? which by oh, definition drives up the dollar? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. It takes place over time. I think, I think we have to be clear about the, uh, the, the timing here because in the short run, you, and as you pointed out, because G is a component of GDP, right, of the way we measure GDP, uh, the national income accounting equation, it's one of the components, then you can boost your GDP temporarily with additional spending. But, and I think the reaction to that, so the, this crowding out, that's something that can occur later on. And now I know Tony Macon had some, he had a good article in Agenda where he was arguing that what the Rudd government did with the Rudd stimulus, uh, that was ultimately defeated by the 
uh, the crowding out, the uh, the fall in net exports. I mean, okay, uh, fair point. Uh, I can understand if you look at the numbers, then eventually that that is the case. But I guess you've got to think about you, we're living in the short. Well, this is the way that the Treasuries are thinking about it, and the, the the Keynesian way. I'm not necessarily defending Keynesian economics, but they're thinking about what's the impact in the short run. I mean, there are several months in which you can boost your GDP or half a year or whatever uh, through these actions. And so I think if you did cut back significantly on government spending, that would have a significant impact in the short run and could reduce inflation uh, in the next, you know, in the next couple of quarters. I mean, I've, that's my feeling. One yeah, thing I've showed I'll, you. I'll yeah. push back a little bit on that. I think, I think just for ease of understanding, since we don't have graphs with us, let's just use the example of increasing fiscal policy. So increasing G. So you're right. So the this, the accounting, uh, the equation that uh, Gene is mentioning there is GDP equals a j- jargon for a second C plus I plus G plus N X. What do I mean? Uh, GDP is consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. Uh, and so what uh, the government can do with fiscal policy is they can just bump up G, or they could give us a bunch of cash and they hope that bumps up C. Right? They bump up G, government spending. And since that's part of the GDP equation, GDP equals these four things, they increased one of those four things, that'll boost GDP. Um, So that's the idea. The the issue there is there's several ways that's offset. If there's Ricardian equivalence, G goes up, but C goes down straight away, pretty much straight away. Uh, If there's internal crowding out, then G goes up, but I goes down. And that again happens pretty quickly because the reason G goes up is they're using the money. And if they're using the money, someone else can't be. I mean, money, this, this money isn't in two places at once. Uh, and the international crowding out is G goes up, but NX goes down. And that happens very quickly. In the GFC example, it started happening like within a month. Uh, and what you got to remember, when the government starts spending money, it's not like it's instantaneous as well. They've got to get, those, uh, get that money out there slowly, find some shovel-ready jobs to do. So it actually mm. does happen pretty simultaneously, these issues. The thing that doesn't happen simultaneously is the impact on the inflation. Right? That takes a bit of a lag because prices take a bit of a while to adjust. And so the fourth mechanism of the RBA adjusting, that happens very imperfectly. But the, those other first three, and of those other first three, Ricardian equivalence and domestic crowding out aren't big events. Ricardian equivalence can be, but we don't understand it very well. Domestic crowding out isn't a big issue for Australia because we have an open economy with international capital flows. But uh, that, that's cold comfort because what that means is that international crowding out happens significantly and happens quickly. So I, I don't see the way around that. And I remember some of uh, Tony Macon's uh, work in this, and I think he was correct. I think he was very correct. He and I used to swap notes on this regularly and, and give feedback on each other's papers on this. Uh, and I think he was the person who was most correct in assessing the ineffectiveness of fiscal policy because we are an open economy. By the way, the Treasury is not aware of a lot of this stuff. They, When asked what their response is to the Mundell Fleming critique, the argument I made here, the, the response from the people inside Treasury that were working on the GFC stimulus was, what is Mundell Fleming? Oh, <laughs> I'm not sure it was that, John. I thought they no, argued I, I that Mundell here. Fleming... No, no, Sorry? I, I knew people in Treasury who walked up to the unit responsible and literally asked the question, and that was literally their answer. Then he said, all right, can I speak to your manager? The manager said the same thing. He said, I'll speak to your manager. He got all the way up to Gruen before he found someone that even knew what it was. That, that's that's yeah. not an anecdote or a guess. This is literally the story we had of what happened inside Treasury during the, the GFC stimulus. Uh, look, I, I think uh, people, people who were making decisions or providing the advice or signing off on the advice like David Gruen and... Uh, Steve, uh, Steve, I'm trying to remember who was there. I mean, Ken Henry, I was there at the time uh, in a budget policy. We were trying to find the money for it. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, I remember those discussions. And look, there may have been some, some people uh, who, who, were, who weren't aware of it. But well, it wasn't in the modelling, right? I mean, Treasury released their modelling. They just assumed that there was no Mundell Fleming critique. There was no international crowding out. They just, oops, I forgot it. When, when it was later pointed out, it was like, oh, yeah, we should have done something. But I, I, I know you worked at Treasury. I also worked at Treasury. One of the things that I find infuriating about the public economic debate in Australia is this Treasury sycophancy where public commentators assume Treasury did it. They must have had a really good reason. There's, uh, sometimes experts do. Sometimes they are overestimated. There's, 
I have other examples of just asking Treasury why they don't factor in behavioral change. And their answer is, I don't know. Seriously. Yeah, too hard, too hard. Um, but they didn't even know where they could find the data. Hmm. But they are overestimated. Yeah. Their, their intelligence often is overestimated in these issues, in my opinion. Yeah, I think with the the response would have been that, uh, I mean, when they did respond to Tony's critique of the fiscal policy, their argument was that, well, because it was a financial crisis, international capital wasn't flowing as uh, as it was prior to the uh, the crisis. So, Perfect. That I mean, so mechanism... where did the money come from then? I mean, if it didn't come from international capital, by definition, it came from Australian capital. So that that's domestic crowding out. I mean, they're screwed either way. I mean, there's no way out of this. And well, by the way, in, yeah, it certainly increased. It certainly did lead to uh, the the yeah. There was that impact on interest rates and and also uh, the exchange rate. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. That did occur. Uh, it's that. So yeah, I, I'm not arguing against that, but I'm just trying to. What I'd say is that they, it's not as if they didn't think about it. I think they're aware that these critiques were out there. They just didn't think it was relevant in the current circumstances, given the scale yeah. of the shock that was coming internationally. That was I say uh, that three pieces of evidence against that. They were literally asked point blank by another Treasury official. That's, that's where I got the story. And they just said, huh? Secondly, they wrote their modelling and their modelling simply didn't include it. Right? And thirdly, the idea that they don't need to factor it in uh, it, it's the only thing that you absolutely do have to factor in. The thing we are guaranteed of is a bunch of those bonds are going to be bought by international investors, and they were, right? So yeah, that, that yeah, yeah. Up and to not factor that in, is it's not like a, oh, whoops, uh, oh, it's just a rounding error. It's just a mistake. It's just wrong. So, yeah, and, so and let, let's talk about the, well, let's talk about some of the evidence that would support their point of view so Australia did not go into recession in the GFC, whereas some other major economies did. I mean, the United States, Great Britain, we're one of the few economies that dodged recession. And also, I mean, John, can you show that chart with the retail trade? This is a chart that David Gruen put in his speech on the, uh, the effect of fiscal policy. Uh, yeah, comparing pre-stimulus retail trade with post-stimulus retail trade, once the RUD money started flowing, it certainly had a you know gave a big boost to uh, to retail trade. It ended up being about five percent higher than it was pre-stimulus. I mean, all of that additional money, people did go out and spend it. Now, was that a good use of money? I think that's arguable. That there is high leakage. So, look, this is going to be offset by, yeah, you're talking about the international crowding out. I'm not denying that. That can occur. Uh, it's going to offset it to an extent. And there's also going to be leakage because people go to Harvey Norman's and they buy a plasma TV and that's imported. So, you know, that money doesn't all, it's not that, all staying that in Australia. That leakage is actually the wrong way of thinking about it. The, the right way of thinking about it is, is the international crowding out, which, which captures the leakage uh, implicitly which they just didn't look at. And yeah, this, this data is looking at, at C, but this is like, the, it's like a whack-a-mole, right? You've got those four variables and they handed money to us and we spent it. Yeah. Absolutely. There's no doubting that. There's no denying that. So C went up and the argument is offsetting that is I and more importantly, net exports, investment and more importantly, net exports went down. So showing a graph that only shows C really doesn't show the story. What you'll find is every time they boosted one place, something else offsets in the other direction, like a game of whack-a-mole. Uh, and it's it's really hard to get out of that if we've got international capital movements, and, and we do have international capital movements. So, and by the way, most countries pursued aggressive fiscal policy. A lot of them fell into uh, recessions. So it, it's, uh, it's the one data point of us not falling into a recession uh, is, is not really overwhelming evidence, especially as net exports were starting to boom with low with our low exchange rate directly after the the, the GFC happened. That was already mm. happening. So that's why people say China saved us. What actually saved us was our, our dollar starting to go down, which was partly then led to China buying much more of our stuff. So you could kind of say China was saving us. But that was happening anyway. Then Rudd stepped in to quote unquote save us by wasting hundreds of billions of dollars of future taxpayers' money. Uh, and yes, we all got to buy a few extra trinkets from Harvey Norman. 
uh, and at the same time, net, net exports imploded. Right, the whack-a-mole game was still being played. It, it, it just didn't add up. Yeah. Look, I just, what I would say, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with a lot of that, but what I would say is we don't know what would have happened to consumption spending if there wasn't that stimulus or there wasn't that support. We don't know what would have happened. I mean, consumption spending could have, uh, yeah, really fallen a lot. And then we could have, uh, you know, had much worse economic outcomes. So that, that's, the, that's where the Treasury and you know, the, the government at the time were coming from. I mean, they were concerned about what all of this meant. And I mean, you remem you, you'd remember all of the dire commentary at the end of uh, 2008 and after Lehman Brothers collapsed and we thought we were going to end up in another Great Depression. And there were yeah. a lot of concerns about where we were going to go. And, and so in a way, some sort of government response was... Uh, was essential to maintain confidence, maintain well, public I, confidence. I, I agree it was inevitable, but it's inevitable because politicians react to fears about getting voted out of power. As soon as Lehman imploded, I said, they're going to try and start bailing people out and they shouldn't, they should let them collapse. We'll have a short, sharp recession and we'll bounce back. So I, I understand it was very scary. I had all of, uh, most of my economics friends, especially the ones working in banking, were pulling their hair out and you know, giving up on free markets. They were spooked. I understand people were spooked, but not, not all of us were. Some of us said at the time, this happens sometimes. Let them go bust. Don't bail them out. We'll have a short, sharp recession around the world, which you know, the world had. Um, mm. But then by trying to save us, we dragged this out, made it a much longer, worse episode, in my opinion. And I agree politicians are going to react, knee-jerk react to fear campaigns and to shrieking journalists. So I agree it was inevitable, but I don't think it was smart policy. Uh, and I think it's it's appropriate for people who weren't spooked and weren't caught up in the fear campaign to call them out at the time, which I did at the time. This isn't 2020 hindsight. Mm. This was the commentary I was, I was giving at the time. By the way, just to, to keep going on that a little bit with uh, spinning that out from points I've said on other issues, does that remind you of anyone uh, or anything else where I say there is a, a true problem and the government and the media exaggerates the hell out of it to get everyone really scared and then because of that, they use it to justify more money and power to politicians and bureaucrats. I've just described the GFC. I've just described COVID. I've just described climate change. I've just described nearly every time the government has managed to run a fear campaign to scare us into giving them ever more power. So it's not like it's a, a, a one-off trick, that one. It's one I've seen before. I've seen this movie before. Fear campaigns lead to bad policy. And I agree everyone was scared. I just don't think... I don't think they should do knee-jerk bad policy because and justify it by saying I was scared. Mm. Do you want to talk to the next uh, the another chart? Oh, I, 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 I thought that was a. I, I just remember at the time, and this is probably going against my argument to an extent. Uh, uh, the uh, one of the big beneficiaries of that uh, stimulus did end up being Harvey Norman, so I thought it'd be good just to just to look at the uh, Harvey N Norman share price and what happened to that that really fell over 2008 and was at a low point in 2009 around uh, in february 2009 around a dollar 80 a share and then uh because the second rudd stimulus package kicked in in april if i remember 2009 it was announced in february and then that share price started going up around then uh so it started recovering and i thought that was uh that was worth pointing out uh, I was just interested in what happened with uh, with Harvey Norman because I know that's where a lot of the rudd money ended up going so it had a bit of a temporary recovery because of the uh, the rudd money one thing I would say John is that it wasn't hundreds of billions of dollars it was only tens of billions at the time so uh yeah well, it was the, the covid it. response that cost us hundreds of billions the covid response uh yeah was was much more excessive than than what we did back in 2009. I'm not defending what we did back then, but it was only the the second the stimulus measures. Oh, I don't know. Maybe they amounted to 100 billion in total, because we had we had a 50 billion dollars in Commonwealth debt, and we had to lift the debt ceiling to 200 billion. So there was 150 billion deterioration over the Ford estimates, but partly that was the the, the loss of tax revenue. Uh, and then the other part of it was all the discretionary measures. Yeah, I was just trying to quickly, I was hoping you talk for a little longer so I could Google it and try to find the number, but I'm only finding the, 
the individual ones. Um, yeah, I yeah. I remember this. The, end. the package that we launched in, because uh, I was heavily involved in it in February 09, was about 43 or 42 billion. And then there was the MyEFO package in October or the October package when everyone was panicking about, uh, you know, that, that people were worried about whether their money was safe in the banks and then they came out and guaranteed bank deposits. And I think that package was about 15 billion. So what, I mean, it was a substantial amount of money and it looked like a ridiculous amount at the time, but what we ended up doing during COVID was, you know, much crazier. It is, it is remarkable the way it, it uh, <laughs> the numbers we're talking about here. It's like a, million, a billion here, a billion there. Pretty soon we're talking about serious money. Um, yeah. and, and the, the strange warping of that going into COVID, the, the amount of money we were talking about, it is, it is remarkable. Um, the time has got away from us here. Uh, did you want to wrap up there or did you, were you happy with that? Oh, I'm happy with that, John. I mean, look, I, I don't disagree a lot with what you're saying. I just think there is some, there is scope for government to, to, uh, to affect the economy with fiscal policy. Sure, it's not as much as, you know, it's nowhere near as much as traditional Keynesians would think, but there, there's some impact and, and hence if there's the, the possibility that they could be doing more with the budget as the, the Treasury's own numbers and also estimates from the IMF suggest that we do have this structural deficit in place, we should be repairing that, we should be getting control of spending so that we're not putting any pressure the, the government shouldn't be contributing to an overheating economy in any way at this stage of the economic cycle and, uh, you know, potentially uh, exacerbating inflation. So that's all, all I'd say. And, yeah, I, I think you've made a lot of good points. And um, uh, maybe we just disagree on the extent to which they're, uh, like, how, how strong they are. And, you know, maybe we should come back to, to that in a future discussion. Yeah, so the finishing on agreement is we, we both think that they shouldn't be in a deficit now anyway, for maybe for slightly different reasons, but we get to the same spot. And I'd prefer to see them fix that by um, cutting some excess government spending to, uh, to live within their means. Um, so we're, we're getting close to the end of this, so I'm going to make my little rant uh, a bit quicker uh, than usual, if I can. Uh, what I wanted to talk about was the gender pay gap. And that didn't come from nowhere, though it wasn't on the top of my mind until I checked the ABS stats. And the ABS has uh, come out with, let's see if I can bring this up, uh, their, their latest release uh, on, um, where can I do that? Yeah, this is like their, their latest little data dump on gender indicators. Uh, and as a part of this, they were talking about the gender pay gap. All right, so we've got a bunch of different data points for men and women. But the one they were talking about here or drawing your attention to is this gender pay gap, which is something that I think a lot of people have heard plenty of times before. Men get paid uh, more than women. And there's a bunch of different ways of measuring it. Uh, you can see if you Google it, you can see a bunch of different numbers, sometimes from the same organization, often ranging from 14.1 here up to something like 28.5. Uh, and the argument here is that men get paid more than women. Businesses are discriminating. Uh, the general complaint goes that this is discrimination against women. Uh, and it's outrageous. There's one thing immediately to note about this. It's just like uh, kind of applying the, the pub test to think about this question. Um, if you could pay women 20% less than men for doing the same job just as well, that's the first assumption. And the second assumption is that at least some businesses out there like to make profits. Crazy assumption, I know. But if we can assume that some businesses like to make profits, why don't they just hire all women workforces? So this is the first thing that should just go off in the back of your head. If, if women were consistently paid 20% less or 14 or 28% less for doing the exact same job, why aren't businesses just taking the free money on the table? I mean, they could just cut their wage bill by 20%. That could go straight to their profit. They could buy an extra yacht and, you know, retire to Mallorca, but they're, they're refusing to cut their costs, refusing to make profits because they are stubbornly saying, and this includes just boards and executive directors who don't have to work with the staff. They're just stubbornly saying, we would like to just lose money on the principle of just not hiring women for no good reason. Well, Which John, just, you know the, the argument, don't you, that they will push back with? That's because of bias. It's because of uh, discrimination. Yes, yeah, that's exactly my point. Right? So the, but the point here is that all of these businesses in this evil capitalist system that all want to make profit, 
They all love their bias so much, even though in big businesses, the person making the decision doesn't work with the women. It's totally abstract. It's on a piece of paper, but they'd say, oh, I'd like to leave millions of dollars on the table. I want mm. to pay them. I want to lose money. I want to run at a loss. I don't like profits. Profit, they're, they're just, you know, profits are they're not for me. I would prefer to just make sure that people I don't even have to work with, I just want to make sure they have the right genitalia. Look, I, I agree, bias and discrimination can exist, but they, you just, first second, well, I'll go to some of the, the other points in a second, but the first question should be, does that pass the sniff test? Does that pass the pub test that most businesses would prefer to make a loss rather than a profit simply so that they can enforce their discrimination on people they don't even have to work with? It's just like a, it's paper shuffling for them. They don't have to actually even see the person most of the time, the decision makers, but they just choose to make a massive loss for no good reason. So that's, it's possible. Look, it's possible. It's possible that in this day and age, there is that much uh, hatred towards women that, that big businesses would just love to make a loss. But I don't think it's very likely for most of the businesses most of the time. So that's just, that's the sniff test. That's not really proving anything. It's just asking people to consider that question. Um, the, the bigger issue here is when you look at some of these numbers, especially when you look at the higher numbers, the, the issue is that it doesn't factor in all of the various differences that are at play. So this is especially true when you look at this higher number here, the 28% the number. The first thing you should ask is, well, wait a second, that's men get paid about 30% more than women, uh, according to mean weekly cash earnings. All right, fair enough. I'm not saying that the data isn't true. The data is what it is. I haven't checked it, but I assume it's correct. The first question you should ask is, wait a second, are they working the same amount of time? Right? I mean, are they, are they all full-time? Are they part-time? How many hours are they putting in? The more relevant question isn't just the total amount of earnings. It's the total amount of equivalent uh, earnings for the equivalent amount of work. So how much hours are they putting in? And that's why you get some of these lower numbers. These lower numbers do factor in uh, the hours. For instance, the 14.1 is only looking at full-time workers and this 11.6 um, is just looking at the hourly rate. So you can see immediately the gender pay cap comes down significantly once you just factor in doing a different amount of work. And it should be easy enough to know if one person does 10 hours work and another person does 20 hours work and the person doing 20 hours work is paid more, that's not sexism. That's not racism. That's not any ism. That's just you get paid more for doing more work. I mean, that's it shouldn't be a shock to anyone. The second issue here, which isn't factored in in any of these numbers, is that men and women on average tend to pick different jobs. And this is a massive issue, right? So the, 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 the five highest paying uh, degrees you can get coming out of university, uh, four out of five of them are majority male. And the five lowest paying uh, degrees you can get coming out of university, four out of five of the lowest paying jobs are majority women. Now, no one forces women to go into primary school education. It's not a requirement. We don't have in our country that it's compulsory. No one forces men to go into engineering. It's not a requirement. These are choices people make. And actually these choices are fairly explicable by just uh, scratching the surface on the average differences in personality types between men and women. Uh, women tend to be people oriented, men object oriented. Uh, and you find therefore women tend to gravitate in towards more people oriented roles. Uh, and you find a lot more women in the education sector and in the health sector, for instance. And you find more men in the object oriented roles, uh, such as like you know, IT and engineering type positions. Uh, and it just so happens that the engineering roles uh, are remunerated higher. Now, the idea that businesses are just remunerating engineers more out of sexism is, is bizarre. It just assumes, again, that businesses like losing money for no good reason. I mean, all businesses would like to pay as little as they can to get the best worker they can. And they, they find that balance. How much do you have to pay to get the right worker? Uh, and all of these industries are doing it. And it's so happens that primary school teachers are paid less and women prefer those jobs. And so that's going to show up in this data that when you look at the average pay to women, it's lower. But it's not necessarily because people are just being sexist. It's because men and women uh, are sometimes different, make different choices. They should be allowed to make those choices. As Jordan Peterson quite eloquently pointed out, the more freedom you give uh, women to be able to make their own choices, the more they choose to work in people oriented roles. In the Scandinavian countries, in, in Norway and Sweden, the more freedom women were given to choose their career, the more they chose the people oriented roles in health and education. So the idea that they're being forced to is, is patently false. And so that explains a lot of it. Now, there is a third thing, which is very hard to work out. It's hard to disentangle. There's a third thing, and that is the trajectory of work. 
So we're finding now more women are getting a university education than men, uh, to which no one seems to complain. Uh, and then those women are going into the workplace. And if you track the men and women at the same age, up until the age of around 30, women tend to be earning more than men. And then around 30, uh, a bunch of women, inexplicably it might be, take a year or two out of the workplace. Uh, and then when they come back into the workplace, they've had a couple of year gap. And what could possibly be happening to a bunch of women around the age of 30 that would make them want to take a year off? Uh, so this is, again, it's not a conspiracy that women give birth. It's not like men got together and, and plotted with God to come up with a tricky plan to make women give birth. This is biology. Uh, and the reality is in a workplace, if one person has a, on a career trajectory where they're putting in a bunch of overtime and they're working all the way through, including through in their 30s, uh, then they're going to be higher up their career path. So when women come back into the workforce after taking a year or two off, if they choose to do that, uh, then sometimes they're further behind on that career trajectory. Again, that doesn't necessarily point to discrimination. These are all choices people make. Uh, and in the context of assuming that most businesses like to make money, the Occam's razor, the best assumption, is that businesses would try to hire the best person for the lowest price consistently. It's just not economically smart for most businesses to discriminate with regards to something that doesn't impact productivity. Uh, and given that the gender pay gap nearly entirely disappears once you do it honestly, that seems to be what the data shows. Uh, any thoughts on that? Oh, look, I agree with you, John. I think it does largely disappear. I wouldn't say it en entirely disappears. Uh, there are multiple, there are several studies that look at this, and I think there is still a, a few percent left over that they can't explain. I know Leonora Reese has been, at, she's at RMIT, she's done some good work on this. Uh, there's, some, there's plenty of studies in the States. Yeah, you have to control for the industry, the occupational choice, years of experience, time in the workforce, all of that. And, and so that's why I, I'm not happy with the ABS publishing the data in this form. They're calling them gender pay gap indicators. Well, sure, but you could read into that that that's an endorsement of this concept of the gender pay gap that this, what is it, 13 or 14%? The, you know, people get that figure in their mind and they think it's real. Whereas as what you're, and, and I agree with you, that's going to largely disappear if you control for these factors that you should be controlling for. Now, there could be still some element of, uh, you know, a lot of young women are concerned about a boys club in corporate Australia. Uh, look, there's possibly some elements of that in some in some places. And I mean, I was a member of a, a club that didn't let women in until uh, three or four years ago. Uh, so um, look, there, there's still there could still be some vestiges of that in some places. And also, I don't know if you've seen the studies, John, where they've done the tests, you know, the blind auditions. As soon as you have blind auditions in uh, for orchestras, you get more women in the orchestra. So there's clearly some discrimination that has occurred, uh, at least historically. I don't know whether it, it still would occur because attitudes have changed. Um, but yeah, I mean, my feeling is that there would st there could be some impact of of those that type of thing on the gender pay gap, but it, it's only going to be a couple of percent at the most, in my view. Yeah, I, I don't doubt the possibility of discrimination. I, I do know some of those uh, blind tests have given. Uh, unexpected results in the direction opposite to the one that the uh, researcher was desperately trying to find. And then strangely, they get published less when they, when they find that <laughs> quote unquote wrong mm. result. Uh, but look, I, I also think we've got to factor in the possibility of discrimination going both ways. I'm, I'm not sure um, that there are some very female dominated industries and the push for equality seems to never be worried about those. Um, the push for equality also never seems to be worried about making sure there are more women in dangerous, crappy jobs that no one likes. Um, there are some quite dangerous, low-paid jobs out there that are overwhelmingly done by men, and no one's interested at enforcing the equality there. It is quite interesting to, to, to see how this works. There's a data point here. Attainment of bachelor degree or above, 29% males, 35% females. Look, I... I if women choose to go to uni and men don't, then say la vie. I just ask people to do an honest thought experiment. If those numbers were reversed, it would be on the front page of every newspaper as a disaster, an outrage, proof of sexism, a disgraceful indictment on the sexism of Australia. Uh, so the numbers are swapped and no one notices. No one looks, no one cares. Yeah. 
Um, no, I don't mind if women go to university more, fine. That, that may well make sense, right? If men are going to be doing riskier, more manual jobs, maybe they don't need to go to university. But I just ask people to look at the totality of this story. I also note when we're doing comparisons between men and women, um, this data point here seems to be somewhat relevant. <laughs> no one yeah. seems to want to... Um, well, that's due to bad thing. behavior on the... I mean, that's due to alcohol, too much drinking and smoking, isn't it, among men? I, mean, I, I don't difference. disagree, but note that when we find a discrepancy in the other direction, we immediately jump to finding all of the reasons that are just based on um, the choices of the people involved. Right? When we find a data point that points the other way, we go out of our way. So if we find a data point where men are worse off, it's the men's fault. Mm. If we find a data point where the women are worse off, it's the men's fault. I'm noticing a pattern. Yeah, anyway, John. Just anyway. one more thing. One more, because this is a, this is one of the points that Leonora and other research, Leonora and other researchers have made regarding the gender pay gap in Australia. A, a significant part of it is the fact that women, in the, if you if in any industry, are less likely to get into the higher level positions than men are. And so Jordan Peterson's argument is that this is because men are more inherently driven or they're more more likely to be a types or type a personalities or the the alpha the alpha male and so they go after those top jobs which require just ridiculous long hours and it's less suitable for women who have uh, parental responsibilities or they're more likely to 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 um uh to to spend they want to spend more time looking after children um i don't know if you have any thoughts on that to the to the extent what extent you think that might be a factor yeah, there's two things that come straight to mind. One is, firstly, I, I haven't seen any data on just men being more... Uh, one argument is that they just ask for raises more often. Uh, I don't know anything about that data. I, that, that doesn't come front of mind. Uh, one is to work your way up the corporate ladder. It tends to go to, and this is... It, it doesn't go to most men. It goes to a very small sliver of, mm. of very uh, focused, overachieving men. Uh, and one of the things that goes into that is people putting in a ridiculous amount of hours. So you can, if, if you put in 10 hours, you put in 20 hours, you might get expected to pay twice as much. But if you're looking at the people who make it to the C-suite, they're the people who have chosen to put in, uh, say, the 80 hours. And you can see here, just on average, women work less. So you would expect them to find it a little bit harder to climb up that slippery pole if you're working less. The other thing is the point I was making before about trajectory. Uh, if you look at the the, the wage trajectory, the, the the career trajectory of men and women, they actually track fairly equally uh, through their 20s. Uh, and then women are more likely to spend a bit more time off spending time with their kids, which, by the way, I, people seem to see that as a problem and something that needs solving uh, to each their own, I would have thought. I mean, let people spend time with their kids. I enjoy, look, I, I earn less now than I could because I take some time off to spend with my kids. I think it's a great lifestyle choice. If people want to do it, I find it very frustrating that the search for GDP is such that politicians are constantly telling everyone, get away from your kids, go to work more. So, but for whatever reason, women often make the decision to spend a bit of time with the kids. Firstly, they, they give birth, that takes time out. That literally takes them out and it bumps down their trajectory. So when you're competing, they're competing very equally through their twenties. And then around the age of 30, uh, by then a lot more women have taken a bit of time out of the workplace to have a kid and maybe spend a bit of time looking after the kid. Uh, and then they go into the workplace, they can't necessarily uh, put in those 80 hours, and that puts them behind in that trajectory. So if it was simply discrimination, if it was simply sexism, why aren't people being sexist during their 20s? Like, it seems inexplicable that we're, we just suddenly, business places, workplaces suddenly become sexist magically the day after you decide to take a year off to have a kid. And Occam's razor would suggest that we attribute that to the fact that you took a year off to have a kid, which is great. Everyone should. It's great to have kids. But that seems to be the cause, as opposed to saying there was secret racism or secret sexism that we just hid for 10 years while they were in their 20s. And then we suddenly let our sexism come out magically the day after they had a child. So I, uh, <laughs> that, that's my take on that, why it uh, can be harder to get into those C-suites. The other thing to keep in mind is the vast majority of men won't get into those C-suites either. It takes a particularly mm. weird sort of driven person who, uh, in, in my assessment of the world, my preference order, I think is often making a mistake to prioritize 80 hour weeks over spending time with family and friends. Uh, so I think it takes a weird sort of person who does that. And it may be that uh, men are more likely to have that, um, that to make that mistake, to have that, um, 
uh, mental misfiring as to decide to prioritize work over all else in their life, which I think is a mistake. But uh, if, if they are making that mistake, then you would expect them to show up in the C-suites. I don't know if that makes sense to you. There, there was one other data point I wanted to find here, which I am, uh, I think I've run out of time for, so I'm just gonna actually stop looking for that now. And I think it's been an hour 10, I'm gonna wrap it up. Uh, Melissa says uh, there aren't a lot of female miners. That is true, although, yeah, and, and miners get paid pretty well. This is another point that Christina Hoff Summers makes in the US. Uh, you just, men are far more likely to do high risk jobs, right? Men seem to put a lower value on their life right? That the price you have to pay a man to take a, a, an equivalent risk is less than the price you have to pay a woman to take an equivalent risk. So women tend to put a higher value on their life. It might also explain why men die younger. I mean, that, that seems to be a, a logical implication of that. I don't think any of that is you know, sexism against men. It's just a, a difference between men and women that leads men into risky occupations, uh, which you know, risky occupations often have a risk premium, right? You get paid to take on the risk. Uh, and it probably leads men to be more likely to Take, uh, to die on the workplace, which they are, right? Men are much more likely to die on the workplace. Um, uh, Nick Armstrong says, it was a fun tonight listening to you both firing up. Love the passionate debate. I thought it was fun. We should try to find something we disagree with uh, about more often because um, I, I enjoy that. Uh, Melissa, again, I use my stimulus to get my car fixed. I think a lot of people did. Uh, the, the big question is, would you have got your car fixed anyway? Uh, so that's that's one question, and yeah, well, it's brought forward, and that's and that's one of the arguments against this sort of this type of policy where it's just a transfer. Well, you, you're just going to you bring forward the spending from an, a, a future period. So yeah, you get your car fixed. You would have got your car fixed next quarter, maybe. So or got into debt to do it. So that's another thing that people yeah. might have done with their credit card to to pay for it. So a lot of people paid off their debt with their stimulus checks. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. It might have been the right thing for them to do. And, and again, you've got the, these politicians and journalists saying that uh, we, we just care about GDP. You have to go out and spend the money. People should do what's right in their situation. And if paying off your debt is the right thing to do, don't let the politicians bully you. Um, one other one, again, from Melissa here, is the unemployment rate an accurate measure? Look, no. Uh, but the thing to note here is we're talking about the change in. So as long as you measure it consistently, then when we notice the change in, we're noticing a real thing. So you're right. It's uh, when most people think of unemployment, they like when they think of employment, they think of a, a job that brings you enough money to live. If you work one hour a week, you're still employed. I get that. That's people think that's cooking the books. Maybe it is a little bit. We've got this un underemployment measure that tries to capture that. But I guess the point I'm making here is that as long as you're consistent in how you measure it, and then you're looking at the changes, you are noticing something real. Right, so unemployment was measured the same way when it was 3.5 and 3.7. So that means we are noticing a, a, a real change. It's not just by the definition. If you change yeah. the definition between months, that would be dodgy. But as long as you have a consistent definition, we can uh, noticing something real that's happening in the real world. Um, can I add word? something there, John? Yeah, Sorry? the ABS is, it has a, a post on this how many people work one hour a week so if you google that you'll find that the abs claims that only 0.1 percent so one in 1000 employed people work uh one hour a week so if you if you cut them if you didn't take account of them then your unemployment rate would be 3.8 percent instead of 3.1 percent right 3.7 percent so it, you know it's not a huge part of the uh the story Yes, uh, point taken. As long as they're consistent, then we can make use of the stats, yeah. uh, even if the stats are imperfect. Uh, with that said, we've gone over the hour 10 mark. I think we'll wrap it up. Gene, thank you very much for coming and joining uh, again. And Pleasure, John. And, uh, a good, fun debate. Uh, to everyone else, we are back here every Tuesday, 7 p.m. It's 7 p.m. Queensland time, 8 p.m. in New South Wales and Victoria, the other states can work it out themselves. You can find us on YouTube and Facebook on the channels for the Australian Taxpayers Alliance, The Good Source, and my personal channel for John Humphreys. So please, now that we're about to end, please click away, go and find us on YouTube and give us a follow for our channels. You can also find me on Rumble, uh, Rumble John Humphreys. Uh, and please go there, give us a follow, give us a like, it'll help us with the algorithm. Uh, but uh, for now, that is enough for today. Thank you for joining us. And wait a second, I'm supposed to set up the, I'm supposed to set up the outro. All right, I will do that now. All right, thanks all. I'll see you again soon.
Hey DJ, what do you think of the budget? Budget naughty. Yeah, budget naughty. Hey DJ, what do you think of the budget?